This video was made possible by my generous Patreon supporters. Thanks, guys! It all happened very fast. One moment I was finishing finals and preparing for a trip to California, and to the next I was in Dulles Airport, about to jet across the Atlantic thanks to a very last-minute turn of events. My life is pretty crazy right now. So why did I drop my plans and leave the country? Well, we'll get to that. All I'll say for now is that Turkish Airlines was the cheapest option available with only 10 days notice. It would be my first time flying the airline, and I was excited to see what was in store. No single airline flies to all 193 UN-recognized nations. Some of them don't even have airports. But Turkish comes the closest, with a whopping 314 destinations in 126 countries. This level of connection can be both a selling point and a burden to an airline. And any carrier of this magnitude needs a magnificent hub to sustain its worldwide operations. So does the experience of flying Turkish Airlines and economy live up to the carrier's lofty scale? The only way to find out is to go for a flight. I started my journey at Washington Dulles International Airport. After clearing security, I hopped on board the Aerotrain, an underground people mover subway opened in 2010 that links most of the terminals. Since it's automated, I took a queue from RM Transit and stood at the front, pretending to drive. My flight was on a Boeing 787 Dreamliner, one of 19 in Turkish Airlines fleet. When I arrived at the gate, it appeared as if people were all boarding at once by row, rather than in groups, although this may not be the case for every flight. Speaking of the flight, let's take a look at the map. From Washington, I would be crossing the Atlantic and much of Europe to reach Istanbul, with a flying time of 10 hours. I'd have a 9-hour stopover in Turkey's largest city, after which I'd be flying another 5 hours to… well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I boarded and got a first look at the conditions I'd be experiencing from Washington to Istanbul. The seats were arranged in a 333 configuration, and each passenger arrived to find a pillow, a blanket, and a pair of headphones. Unlike my previous Streamliner experiences, where the crew usually took control of the window's unique dimming features, I had complete control of my window during the whole flight, although it would take a while to shift between brightness levels. The seat back screens came with a phone charging port, and the IFE featured an annoying amount of skippable ads. I had to go through three just to get to the movies. Turkish language safety videos began to play as we pushed back from the gate, followed by English ones. These featured an unusual announcement regarding a special safety video for disabled passengers, and even showed a flight attendant using sign language. I unfortunately never got around to watching this bonus video, but Turkish was the first airline I'd ever flown with this option. Another cool feature that I'd always wanted to experience, but had never seen on a previous flight, was a pair of external cameras mounted on the front and bottom of the plane. That meant I could see straight in front of the aircraft as we made our way to the runway and took off, heading east into the night. Meal service began as we passed over the Atlantic coast. I chose the pasta, which came with hummus, a very tiny salad, and blueberry crumble for dessert. I decided to watch a Turkish period drama while I ate. This Islamic scholar is about to get his rear end handed to him. After dinner, the crew brought out amenity pouches, which included slippers, socks, and a toothbrush and toothpaste. The brush had a rather flimsy handle and was difficult to use but I appreciated the other features. That said, I'm not sure how I feel about airlines encouraging every passenger in economy to change their socks all at once. I didn't sleep the greatest, but I managed to pack in a few hours before breakfast. For this meal, I chose the scrambled eggs, which came with fresh vegetables and fruit, as well as Turkish black tea. I kept watching my period drama, where the poor main character was now being accused of stealing a precious text and staging the incident with the bandits. It turned out that this girl had taken the text for her own scholarship, but nobody figured that out before we arrived in Turkish airspace and began a scenic descent into Istanbul. We have made it to Istanbul, morale tired and a little dehydrated, but 
I've made it. Let's see what we can see. It took a hot minute to get to passport control, but I cleared that in just a few minutes. Side note, US citizens need to pay $50 for a visa ahead of time in order to visit Turkey. Go think Caleb did his research. Turkish Airlines has two flights per day between Dallas and Istanbul, and I opted for an earlier one so I could experience Istanbul's wild and wonderful transit. That adventure will be on the channel next week, and you can watch it right now on Patreon if you want. Let's cut back to when I returned to the airport. Istanbul International Airport is only four years old, having replaced the old Ataturk International in 2019. The two words that I think describe it best are big and gray. Even with plants all over the outside, it doesn't shake the overall gloomy vibe that the building presents. There's initial bag screening just to enter the building, where the staff kept trying to talk to me in Turkish, even after I told them I didn't speak the language. While I respect that this is their country and they should have the freedom to speak their own language on the job, this isn't a good look for an airport that purports to be a global hub. I would guess the vast majority of travelers would know a smattering of English, at least more than they know Turkish, and I hope the airport staff would be more respectful of this. Heck, the only Turkish I know is Menurezme. So fun Istanbul fact, Istanbul was Constantinople, but now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. It's been a long time gone, Constantinople, but now it's Turkish delight on a moonlit night. Istanbul's duty-free area is insanely large, at 55,000 square meters. It's larger than Rhode Island TF Green Airport's entire terminal, with shops selling pretty much everything except for soap or dental floss. Exhausted from a day of metro riding, I chilled in one of the airport's nap zones until it was boarding time, taking advantage of the free reclined chairs and charging ports. Then I headed to my gate. But in retrospect, I should have left earlier. I feel like I'm burning all the calories of the Donner wrap I ate earlier just walking through this airport. And of course my gate is D17. I had to walk almost half a mile to my plane, which was all the way at the end of the concourse. IST has no people move for trams of any sort, despite being the largest single terminal airport building in the world, and I had to make my trip entirely on moving walkways. But finally, at long last, I stepped onto my second plane and collapsed into my seat, finally free of the chaotic cavern that was Istanbul Airport. My onward flight to my destination was on an Airbus A330, my first of the type, with seats in a 232 configuration. Two different seat controls let me recline and slide my seat cushion forward, and a leg rest was available, although I was way too tall for it. The IFE was more old school, but still worked, along with the attached USB plug. Pillows and earbuds were available on the seats, but no blankets this time. We took off into the night once again, and this time I slept like a dead man until mealtime. Side note, do you guys have a system in place to make sure you don't sleep through dinner on a plane? Sound off in the comments if you do. After the meal, which was pretty similar to what I'd had before, there was another round of amenity kits, this time missing the toothbrush and toothpaste. As the sun set, I chatted with the man in the seat behind me, who invited me to his wedding after about 15 minutes of conversation. We could see the lights of Cairo, Egypt out the window a country I'd heard about in countless Bible stories and history books, but never seen with my own eyes before. So what's my verdict on Turkish Airlines? They're adequate. They sold me a ticket for only $624 just 10 days in advance, and that came with two free checked bags. The seat was okay, the food was good, the IFE had good selection, and I loved the front and bottom cameras. But that said, their hub felt really poorly planned, more grandiose than usable and less navigable than, say, Doha or Singapore's main airports. Staff on board the plane and in the airport weren't the most personal, with language being an issue like I mentioned before. Of course, it could all be a misunderstanding. Do I look Turkish to Yins? But then again, friends of mine who flew through Istanbul just a few weeks before me reported even ruder staff. So long story short, if Turkish is your cheapest option to fly, don't go in with too high expectations and you'll most likely be okay. And now you're probably wondering, where exactly is Caleb going? Well, this trip has everything to do with a woman named Kalkidan. You've probably seen her before if you watch my channel. What you might not know is that she is also my girlfriend and the love of my life. But in her culture, you don't just go trumpeting that on social media. At least, not until you've met the family. So that's exactly what I'm on my way to do.